So this is start of chapter three. This is a theory of well orderings and then ordinal numbers. Probably well orderings were Cantor's greatest contribution to mathematics. People think about him discovering two different kinds of cardinal sizes in infinity, but actually it's a theory of well orderings that kind of is, is the main thing that he's perhaps known for. And isolating that property of well orderings is the basis of ordinal numbers or thinking about orderings that are somehow longer than the natural numbers. And I started out in the very first lecture just giving an example of this. So this is where the example comes back again. So this is an example, this is 3, 1 in the notes. And the idea is that I just take the natural numbers <clears throat> and I put the evens in their ordinary ordering before the odds in their ordinary ordering. So here are the evens. And when that is all written out, I now put down the odds. So the idea here is that I've got somehow a copy of the natural numbers, at least in terms of their ordering, these dots, followed by another copy of that, the natural number. So I can just define an ordering then here on the natural numbers, so let's stick with omega. Okay, you do it like this. I've got a curly less than here, and the less than says n is less than n if and only if <coughs> n is even and m is odd, or they're both even and they're both odd. And n is less than m in the usual ordering. <clears throat> so I could have n here, even m from this block of odds, or they're in the same block, but with their usual ordering. So completely simple idea here. And the point is that this is a well ordering. And recall what a well ordering was from the first chapter. It's a strict total order, which is what this picture is. Things are linearly lined up. But any non empty subset has a less than minimal element. And again, this is kind of obvious from our picture. If I pick any collection here, Pick any subset of the field of the ordering here, omega. Then x has a, a curly less than least element. And it's obvious what to say here. <laughs> if x has evens, it comes down into this portion, right? Then it's the least even. If x has no evens, then it's the least odd. I should say if x is not empty. I may forget that. And this is what it is to be a well order. It's a strict total ordering, and any non empty subset has a, a least element in the sense of the ordering here. So this is the kind of canonical picture to keep in mind right, when we come to think about transfinite well orderings. Notice, of course, I mean, there's a couple of things. Of a well ordering, there must always be a least element in the well ordering. After all, I could take x here as all of the integers, right? In which case, there's supposed to be a least element, which of course would be zero. The other thing to note is that every element has a unique successor.
And this is the other characteristic of well orders. Every element has a unique successor. <coughs> I just have to pick an element here, and I let x be the collection of natural numbers that come after this element in this curly less than ordering. So if an element in the well order has successors later on, it's got an immediate, unique immediate successor because that will be the least element of x here. So the least element of x is the unique immediate successor of 4. And then this is exactly what happens in all well orderings. Every element, if it has successors, there's a unique immediate successor. <clears throat> Does not mean that every element has a unique immediate predecessor. Right? In the picture of one of we had here, one has no immediate predecessor. Right? because the evens go all the way up to one here. Okay, so this is what uh, a typical uh, well ordering will look like. And now we're going to investigate some of the kind of basic mathematics of well orderings. And we'll see that all orderings are comparable. The pictures of these well orderings all look like they're either the same length or one is an initial segment of the other. So we'll be able to say there's, for any well ordering, there's a, an equivalence class of well orderings that are order isomorphic to it. And then we'll pick out a canonical representative of each of these equivalence classes. And these will be our ordinal numbers. So the definition of ordinal will furnish us a way of picking out kind of canonical representative of each equivalence class of well orderings. And that'll be the task of the next few lectures. So to take up where I left off on the board, consider, well, again, example 3.2 from the notes. This is page 25. Uh, this is just to reiterate what I said on the board in a more general setting. If I've got A with A curly less than here, is a set with this curly less than a WO, a well order. And I'm going to use the notation that if B is just a subset of A, then B with less than is also a well order. So though the less than compares all elements of A, and so A fortiori compares all elements of B, I don't bother writing less than restricted to B cross B. Right? The fact that this might compare more elements than there are in B, I just is neither here nor there. But the point is also that a subset of a well order also gives us a well order. It's because if I consider any non-empty subset of B, right, it's going to have a less than least element because any non-empty subset of B is a non-empty subset of A. And this is a well order, so it will have a less than least element. So it's kind of trivial that this is the subordering of A will also be a well ordering. 
So for the obvious reason, that if I've got something that's non-empty and it's a subset of B, it's also a subset of A here. So and as this is a well order, X has a least element. And the next thing that's stated in the <coughs> example is, again, what I said on the board, every element has a unique successor. So every element X of A has a unique successor. And I've written that as this way, the infimum of all the objects Y in A, which come after X. And the infimum is in the curly less than ordering, of course. So it's the least upper bound of the things, least strict upper bound of X. Okay, so why do we concentrate so much on well orders? Well, it's because we've got an induction principle for well orders in the same way that we do for natural numbers. And its proof uses the property of well order just as we have for mathematical induction. It's really no different. I'll write it out again um, slowly so we see how this is going to work. So what I have is X with a less than, and I'm going to write is a member of the class of well orders. I won't say that each time, I'll just say it's a member of WO. And then what do we have? We have if some property phi holds for, we're trying to prove some property phi holds for all members of X here. So the criterion is, if I pick any element z here of x, and suppose I know that for all y's that come before z, if phi y holds, then phi z holds. So again, think perhaps of natural numbers. If X is the set of natural numbers, if I know for all numbers Z, if for all earlier numbers phi Y holds, it implies that phi Z holds here. Suppose I know all of this, right? Then I know actually for all Z in X, phi Z holds. And so this implies this here. So um, just want to match up my brackets. Maybe I need another one there to pair off with this. <clears throat> Right, so this statement is about Z, for any Z that's in X. So I have this property phi for all Zs in X here. So again, a simple proof, so to speak. 
Okay, so we have that this is supposed to imply this. So I suppose for a contradiction, this holds, but this fails. So the antecedent holds, namely the antecedent is the bit before the arrow, so the stuff in the square brackets. And then for this to fail would mean this set is not empty. It's the collection of W's in X such that phi fails of W. Right? It's not the case that for every Z in X, phi Z. So there are things such that not phi W holds. And now we use the all important property that it's a well ordering. If this is a non empty subset of the field of the well order, it's got a least element. As this is a well order, there is some least element. So let W zero in Z be Z's least element. Here. And then, you know, then you can see it coming. I know that for anything that comes earlier than this W zero, Phi y holds. So I'm just plugging in w0 here. So the antecedent then says phi w0 holds. So, but then by the square bracketed thing, we have phi of w0. And that's a contradiction because w0 is supposed to be in z. So if the antecedent holds, Z is empty and we have this. So that's then proven. So note, as I said, it's exactly like the proof of mathematical induction. What it relies on is just like for the natural numbers that this is a well order. And we'll see just like for um, mathematical um, Induction, we can prove a recursion over well orderings, a recursion theorem, and prove by induction that we can define uniquely functions by recursion. So it'll just mirror what we did for the natural numbers. <laughs> so again, this was all due to this theory here was all due to uh, Cantor. So what we're going to do now then is look at some basic mathematics of well orders. So turning the page, if we look at definition three, four, uh, let's see what this says. So this is just some notation. If I take a well order, like this. Then the, and officially we might say the less than initial segment so x sub z of X determined by some element Z Z then big X 
is the set of predecessors of Z under less than. So this is a set of all predecessors. So less than predecessors of Z. <clears throat> so the picture would be, if I draw it growing upwards, here's X, here's Z, some element of X. X sub Z here is everything that's down below. So this is an initial segment, indeed a proper initial segment of X. Z is not a member of X sub Z. And X sub Z is always a proper initial segment. Sometimes people will classify X as an initial segment of itself. But these X sub Z's always proper initial, they are true initial segments. It's a proper initial segment of X. That is X, it's not all of X. X sub Z is not all of X. In my example with the evens and odds, we had uh, we had um, n. So I used omega, didn't I, for the naturals? of um, evens and odds above. This is an example three, this was number 3.1. I would say that omega sub two, so things that come before two, this would just be actually just zero. Whereas the things that come before one, this would have been all of the evens. Etc. Okay, so we're now going to think about order preserving maps <coughs> between well orders or between total orders to start with. <clears throat> And we'll see that unlike for just strict total orders, isomorphisms between well orders have to obey certain restricted properties. So three, five here. So suppose I've got a map from a well ordering to itself. What could this be like? It's order preserving. So it sends things, if it takes two things, one is less than the other, F of the one is going to be still less than F of the other. So it preserves the less than ordering. Okay. So to write it out explicitly, what it means to be order preserving. 
Okay, so I suppose I've got an order preserving and this will order to itself. Then the lemma says it must be, it can't be a decreasing, it can't be a pushing down function. Then for all z in x, z has to be less than or equal to f of z. We can't have that for some z, f of z ends up below z when we send the ordering to itself. Okay. So here's x, here's x again, f is going from x to x here. The lemma says that somehow these orderings, they all have to be horizontal or above going upwards. I can't have some f sending some z up here, down here. That's what can't happen. Okay, so proof by contradiction. Suppose for some z in x, we had, as in my dotted diagram here, f of z comes below z. <clears throat> okay, so if there is some z that's like this, by the word ordering on strict lists, then there's going to be a least element, z0, for which this happens. There's at least z sub zero in x with the property that f pushes it down. And right? so there's a first thing in the well order here, which gets pushed down. Now we just use the fact that f is order preserving. F is OP. So I apply F to this. If U is less than V, F of U is less than F of V here. But Z0 is supposed to be the least thing which had the property when I apply F to it, it goes down. But oops. Lo and behold, I apply f to this, and that also goes down. That's a contradiction. So this inequality, if you like, this contradicts the choice of z0. This was supposed to be the least thing which would get pushed down, but then this also gets pushed down. So that finishes that lemma. So we say that order preserving maps on well orders are not decreasing. They're increasing, or sorry, they're non decreasing. Now, note how this fails for non well orders. The example here is if I take the integers positive and negative with the usual ordering, this is not a well order. For example, the set of empty, sorry, the set of negative integers has no least element under less than. So I just define, I could define F an order preserving map from Z to itself. And this is kind of easy. I just subtract one.
So it pushes everything down. Right? In fact, here, not just only is it a, a decreasing map, actually, it's, a, it's an isomorphism between Z and itself. It's a one, one onto map, which pushes everything down by one. So it's an isomorphism. Because it's also one to one and onto. So it's an order preserving bijection. Notice there's more than one, there are infinitely many isomorphisms. Right? Here's another one. I just look at uh, G. I just define G of K to be K minus two. Right. So obviously G is going to be one to one onto and it's order preserving from Z to Z. So there are and of course, I could just change this two to anything. Right? So there are infinitely many isomorphisms of Z with itself. But that's not the case for well orders. The well or an isomorphism between a well order and itself has to be the identity map. We can phrase that as an isomorphism between differing well orders and draw out what I just said as a corollary. Suppose I've got x less than, and I've got y, and I put a prime there to indicate it's a different ordering. So x and y, two different sets, they're not necessarily related to each other in the way that z and z obviously was. Now I'm supposing that this is an isomorphism So a bijection, which is order preserving. And another part of the assumption is that these are both well orders. Then uh, the claim is F is the unique isomorphism between X and Y. If is the unique such isomorphism. Okay. So we'll give a proof for that. And that's a little bit of sort of diagram chasing. Let's suppose we've got two isomorphisms. So as I've got some F and some G, and they both go from X to Y, and they're both isomorphisms. So I've been saying isomorphism. I see in the notes, I was pedantic and I kept calling them order isomorphisms. Isomorph order is the only relation we've got on the set here. So bijections preserve the order. So what do I have? I've actually got a way of sending x to itself, I could first use g to send x to y. 
And then because G is on to in one to one, I can use the inverse of F to pull that back to X. So I do first G and then the inverse of F. And that's going to send X to X. <clears throat> Because these are both bijections, this is a bijection. If G is order preserving, okay, we order preserve the relationship between two elements here to, he to here. Both F and F to the minus one are order preserving. So when I act upon those two elements by F to the minus one, that preserves the order when I pull back here. So you should check then that this is an order isomorphism. Okay, if you're asked to check whether something is an order isomorphism, there are two things. It should be a bijection and it preserves order. But now we've got a lemma that says something about order preserving maps like that, the previous lemma. So by lemma 3.5, what I've got is that this must be an order, must be a non-decreasing map. So for all Z in X, Right. F to the minus, sorry, Z is less than in the X sense over here. Less than or equals here. Okay. But if itself is order preserving, so as F is itself order preserving, I could apply F to both sides of this. F of Z, now over here, F of Z is less than prime or equal to f of the right-hand side. But that is just g of x, sorry, z. Here. So I have f of z is less than or equal to g of z in the sense of the ordering on y. Okay, now the roles of f and g here are completely symmetric. Right? I could have renamed f as g and g as f here, and the argument would have been just the same. So by applying the same argument again, So by applying the same argument again, just starting out with F and then thinking of G to the minus one, I'm going to end up concluding that G of Z is less than or equal to f of z. These were for any z's in x. So I've got less than or equals both ways around here. So this is greater than or equal to this, 
but also it's less than or equal to it. So g of z equals f of z. So f does not differ from g. So each of these is the same and then the unique isomorphism between x and y. So that finishes the lemma there, which I didn't number. Three, six. Yeah. So and then the corollary is that an isomorphism of a well order to itself must be the identity map. So corollary three seven here. If I've got a well order and F is an order isomorphism X with itself, then F is the identity. All I'm doing is applying the previous lemma where y less than prime is just the same as x less than. That would say the isomorphism between here and here is, is unique. Well, it has to be f then. I mean, f then has to be the identity because the identity is such an isomorphism. Since aid is indeed and indeed trivially, such an order preserving isomorphism, F must equal it. So it is short for the identity map. Right. It of Z equals Z. So that's an important uh, outcome there. There are no isomorphisms other than the identity between a well order and itself. And you can think about that in the context of the natural numbers right? with the ordinary ordering. You can see quickly enough, right? There's not going to be an order preserving bijection between the natural numbers uh, and the natural numbers you know, which shifts something, which moves one of the natural numbers. So, just draw your attention to an exercise here. Suppose I, like as in the last lemma, I've got here, uh, order isomorphism between X and Y with their respective orders. Right? So here's a picture. Here's X with its less than going up the page and here's Y with its less than. They're isomorphic, so the pictures are, look exactly the same here. So here we have less this less than, and here we have this less than prime going up the page. And again, these are both well orders. And if you give me any Z that's in here, any Z in X,
I could look at this isomorphism, which is going from x to y, f here, and I could just restrict it to things that come before z. In other words, the initial segment before z. So I'll look at f and I'll restrict it to the things that come before z. And right? so here is the initial segment of x determined by z. Well, f is just going to take these things, order isomorphically over to the portion of y that's determined by, well, the image of z. So this is going to go from xz less than over to, slightly running out of space, y f of z with its less than. This is an isomorphism. So to complete the exercise, you have to just verify the two properties to being an order isomorphism. That it's a bijection between this and this, and it preserves order. Preserving order is trivial because this is just the restriction of an order preserving map. So it'll be order preserving. The only question is, have I calculated right what the domain and the range should be? And then that's just a matter of a little logical reasoning right, that's here. So a final lemma here. Okay, so, so this is Cantor in 1897. A well-ordered set cannot be order isomorphic to any segment of itself. Sorry, well-ordered set. cannot be order isomorphic to any initial segment of itself. So proof by contradiction. Suppose I've got a well order, and let's suppose I've got f, which is an order isomorphism of this x to some initial segment of itself, a collection of things that come before some z. So here would be the picture of x, here's z. Somehow this isomorphism is supposed to squash everything into here. But we've already proven enough to show that this, this can't happen. By lemma um, three, five, an order isomorphism here, or any order preserving map of x to x right here, must be non decreasing if x is a well order. So by lemma 3 5, I've got that z comes before or equals f of z here for any z in x. But what have we got here? f is supposed to crowd everything below z. So all of this stuff up here has to end up below z. In particular, z ends up below z under f.
because f sends z to something below z here, which is what I've just written down here. So as f of z is supposed to be in this initial segment, f of z must be less than z, which is what I've said here. So what I've got is both z is less than or equal to f of z, but at the same time, it's less, strictly less than z, which is absurd. Okay. So this is a contradiction. Right. And that lemma then there is, is finished. Fine, uh, we'll continue the discussion next time of more basic properties of well orders. And we'll go into the next section, uh, 3.1. We'll start defining some transfinite ordinal numbers after that.